He is risen. What, what, what an incredible, glorious shout filled with inexpressible joy when you think about it, right? He is risen. Yeah. <laughs> and this morning, we're going to come to the end of our look at the views of Easter as seen through the experiences of certain people that God has providentially kept for us in the pages of Scripture. The underlying theme to all of this has been to ask the question, what did the cross mean to these people? Our journey started, if you remember, a couple weeks ago. We looked at the experience of Barabbas, Barabbas, whose name literally means son of the father. He was convicted, notorious zealot, and was condemned to a cross. And instead, the crowd chose him over the son of God. He lived, and Jesus died. We stood next to the Roman centurion, who, along with his soldiers, was terrified at the ominous darkness that came across the land. An earthquake that happened while Jesus was on the cross. Surely this man was the son of God, was all that hardened military man could say. From there we came alongside Joseph of Arimathea, a rich man that sat on the Jewish leadership council. But he was also a secret disciple of Jesus. But through his actions, and his actions he gave Jesus a proper burial, he put the honor of Jesus first, publicly confessing, that he was indeed a follower of Jesus. <laughs> and lastly, and, and lastly, we just merely scratched the surface when we looked at what the cross meant to Jesus. We considered the verse in Hebrews 12 that said, For the joy set before him, he endured the cross. And we saw how that joy was the church, his bride, the bride that he's prepared to be presented to himself. And we marveled, we marveled at how. His bride, us, we share in His joy. And that will all be celebrated at the great wedding feast. So this morning now, we consider our last view of Easter. And that is from the vantage point of the church. The church being every true believer all throughout history since that first Easter, 1,987 years ago. <laughs> What's critical for us to grasp at the outset, before we even begin this, is that the cross of Jesus Christ is central, central to the Christian faith. If you were to ask a Christian to summarize the gospel with one word, they would probably say the cross. It's an all-inclusive term, and it speaks to many things. It speaks to his crucifixion on the cross, his suffering the wrath of God on that cross, his blood being shed on that cross, his dying on that cross. All as a substitute for the sins of man. All as the perfect Lamb of God. The cross was always in God's redemptive plan. If it was possible, if it was even possible to chart a timeline of all of eternity past and future, the cross would be right in the middle. It is the single most monumental event in the course of time. Nothing has had a more profound impact on humanity than the cross of Jesus Christ. And that's the way we have to see it. The cross was an all-inclusive event, not just an instrument of execution. Now what also must be included as we look at the cross on Easter Sunday is the resurrection of Jesus Christ that followed it. Jesus died, and they all knew he was in that tomb. But he rose again three days later as he said he would. It was seen by the women first who ran off and told the disciples. And in those days, the testimony of a couple of grieving women it would have been deeply discounted. It would have been completely ignored. Someone took him away, they said through their tears. We heard in John's Gospel this morning that two of the disciples ran to look. One stoops down and looks inside, not wanting to step into the sacred space of this tomb. And he sees it empty. The other disciple, and we learned that it was Peter, and not surprisingly being Peter, just goes down inside and looks around. And he sees the burial lands. Folded. This is certainly not the scene of a grave robbery. And after the disciples leave, Mary stays behind. And as we heard again this morning, she meets the risen Lord in the garden. She doesn't recognize him at first. But when she, when she hears him mention her name, she recognizes, right, recognizes him, and her grief is turned to incredible joy. Teacher, she cries out. And she clings to him. 
the love and joy in that moment is absolutely amazing. And along with the resurrection, what we also have to include with the cross is the ascension of Jesus. The scriptures tell us that after spending some time with Jesus after his resurrection, he shared meals with them. They learned from him. He blessed them. And those men gathered and watched him ascend into the clouds. And we know that he took a seat at the right hand of God. So he rode into Jerusalem, the king riding humbly on a donkey. He suffered, died, was buried, and he rose. And he ascended to take his seat, his rightful seat, exalted by God Almighty, his seat as Lord of all. And all of that is centered on the cross. So what does this all mean to the believer? What does the cross mean to those who believe in Jesus Christ? And for that, we turn to God's word. We'll begin first with the, a little bit of a passage we, we heard read from 1 Corinthians. It'll be 1 Corinthians 15, verses 3 through 8. For what I have received, I passed on to you as of first importance, that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures, and that he appeared to Cephas, and then to the twelve. After that, he appeared to more than 500 of the brothers and sisters at the same time, most of whom are still sleeping, or still living, though some have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James, then to all of the apostles. And last of all, he appeared to me also, as to one abnormally born. And then turn to Ephesians chapter 2. Ephesians 2, verses 1 through 9. Ephesians 2, 1 through 9. As for you, you were dead in your transgressions and sins in which you used to live when you followed the ways of this world and the ruler of the kingdom of the air, the spirit who is now at work in those who are disobedient. All of us also lived among them at one time, gratifying the cravings of our flesh and following its desires and thoughts. Like the rest, we were by nature deserving of wrath. But because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ even when we were dead in transgressions. It is by grace you have been saved. And God raised us up with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus, in order that in the coming ages he might show the comfortable riches, incomparable riches of his grace, expressed in his kindness to us in Christ Jesus. For it is by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not for yourselves, it is a gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. And finally, 1 Peter. 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 3 through 5. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In his great mercy, he has given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead and into an inheritance that can never perish, spoil, or fade. This inheritance is kept in heaven for you, who through faith are shielded by God's power until the coming of the salvation that is ready to be revealed in the last time. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. There's, there's, there's so much. It's a healing back an infinite size on you. There's so much for us to, to be blessed by and to be fed by. So Lord, we pray this morning that we would leave here today rejoicing filled with incomparable joy, knowing that you are alive, you have risen, and what that means to us. So we pray you are with us this morning, Father. We pray that you reveal what it is you have us see in these words of yours. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. So, so where do we begin? Where, where do we begin in finding some sort of answer to what does the cross mean to believers? You know, like, like last week, I found this one to be a monumental task to even attempt to begin to answer that because there's just so much, there's so much to be said. So, well, here goes. <laughs> Let's see how we do. What if Jesus had simply come down from heaven, performed all the signs and wonders that confirmed that he was indeed sent from God and lived a sinless life? And what if he went on to suffer God's wrath on a cross die for our sins on that cross, be buried, and that was the end of it. Would that have been enough? 
If that was all God had ordained, then absolutely it would have been enough. Because we would know that it was the foretold Son of God who came and fulfilled the law that we had no hope in obeying completely. And that He was the Messiah that would suffer the wrath of God for His people, saving them from the suffering, from suffering the wrath of God for themselves. On that cross, Jesus willingly gave His life as a sacrifice to God in our place. So that the guilt of sin, the weight of our sinful nature, the burden of not being right with God would be lifted. And we know it wasn't only the physical agony of crucifixion that paid that debt. It was the wrath of God that Jesus suffered that led to the forgiveness of our sin. Without a doubt, if that was all it was, we would be overflowing with thanksgiving and praise to God. Because with forgiveness of sin, through someone atoning or paying for our sin as our substitute, comes a reconciliation. Reconciled with our Creator and Holy God, something we couldn't do for ourselves. And we would be at peace with God. We would best be set free by His mercy and love. Because by simply hearing the words of Jesus, we know that we were apart from God. We know that we didn't know Him and that something was wrong. His light shining on us would illuminate all the sins that kept us from Him. We were dead in our sins, Paul says to the Ephesians. We were spiritually dead, and we didn't know it. We were lost in our ways, following the ways of the world, enjoying the things that this world enjoys, certainly not living a life that brought honor to God. And as we just heard in verse 4 of Ephesians chapter 2, Paul reminds us that because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive in Christ Jesus, even when we were dead in our transgressions. He did it because of his love for us. He did it because of his unending mercy upon us. And he did it to breathe new life into us. And he fills our hearts with the Holy Spirit, the comfort that Jesus promised to send, the deposit or guarantee of our eternal joy. We're no longer dead in sin, but alive in Christ. All for his good pleasure and for his glory, by his grace. For by grace you have been saved. And all of that was made possible by the cross. So yes, if that's all God planned it to be, it would have been perfectly enough and we would be thankful. There would be reason to rejoice. And we would be hopeful that Jesus was in heaven as a spiritual presence for us. But it's kind of a, it would have been a kind of a disconnected hope because we really wouldn't know for certain what had happened to Jesus. But as we noted earlier, the cross isn't just about the death of Jesus Christ. Paul says here in his letter to the Corinthians that Jesus died for the forgiveness of our sins according to Scripture. And he was referring to Isaiah 53, where we know that passage very well, that it was through the prophet that God reveals his plan to strike down his son for our trespasses and our iniquities. Paul goes on to say that Jesus died and was buried. And there's a finality to that. He died and he was buried. His lifeless body was laid in that tomb by Joseph that day. He was wrapped in cloths and the stone was rolled into place and a Roman guard was posted there. But, Paul goes on to say that not only did Jesus die, not only was he buried, but that he was raised on the third day. And all of that fulfilled scripture. Jesus didn't just die that day. He wasn't buried and with his body left to return to the earth. He didn't get better in three days to the point where he could have rolled the stone away himself. He didn't pass out on the cross like a lot of people think. His disciples didn't move him. Remember, they all ran off in fear. He died and he rose. He physically rose from the dead three days later. He was seen by Peter. He was seen by the disciples. He was seen by Mary Magdalene. He appeared to many. And later on, he appeared to Paul in a very dramatic way. The physical resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead proved and confirmed for us, not for him, but for us. It declared in a mighty way that he is indeed the Son of God, fully God and fully man. The resurrection decisively declared that not even death can hold him because it was the power of God that raised him out of that tomb. Not only could death not hold him, he conquered it. Death, the ultimate enemy of mankind. The thing that God told Adam, mankind would experience when he said, you shall surely die. Jesus is superior 
to death. And they all saw him. And they all talked with him. He showed them the nail wounds. And they were filled with incredible joy. He's risen is all they could say. Now, today, how do we connect with that? Jesus, Jesus has not appeared to us like he did back then. He hasn't come into one of our prayer meetings or one of our worship services and sat down and eaten with us. After all, he is the Son of God, so we would expect something supernatural to happen to him. It was all foretold in Scripture when we read Psalm 16. You will not abandon me to the realm of the dead, nor will you let your faithful ones see decay. So, of course, God would raise Jesus from the dead. But how do we connect with that? Speaking through Daniel the prophet, God tells us this. Multitudes who sleep in the dust of the earth will awake. Some to everlasting life, others to shame and everlasting contempt. In the fifth chapter of John's gospel, Jesus quoted that same passage saying this. A time is coming when all who are in their graves will hear his voice and come out. Those who have done what is good will rise to live. And those who have done what is evil will rise to be condemned. This tells us that everyone will be resurrected one day. And all will have to stand before God. And to some, it'll be a day where salvation is made complete and saved souls will receive their glorified bodies. To others, it'll be a day of terror. A day where they will cry out for the mountains to fall on them and hide them from the wrath of the Lamb. So who is raised to life? And who is raised to condemnation? Peter tells us that God in His great mercy has given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. The resurrection of Jesus Christ gives anyone who believes in him a living hope. Not a fleeting hope that we hear all the time, and I hope it doesn't rain, I hope we get there on time. This hope that we have, this living hope, is an expectant hope. One where promises will be kept in honor. The hope that keeps us focused on the cross and persevering through anything. It's a hope founded on this, pro this promise from the Lord. Jesus said this, and he, this that he promised this, that anyone who believed in him would not perish, but have eternal life. John the Apostle writes in his first epistle, this is his command, to believe in the name of his son, Jesus Christ. Believing he is the Messiah, the Son of God, our Savior, the Lamb of God, and also believing that he physically rose from the dead. That is the good that Jesus spoke about when he's regarding resurrection unto life. We can't do anything good on our own. Certainly nothing worthy of salvation. All we can do is put our faith in him and his promises. And believers are intimately connected with his resurrection. Paul says in 1 Thessalonians, For we believe that Jesus died and rose again, and so we believe that God will bring with Jesus those who have fallen asleep in him. Jesus went first, first to be followed by those who are in him, those who believe in him. Elsewhere, Paul writes that Jesus went as the first fruit, the first fruit being the best of the crop that would be presented to God. And believers will follow him in the resurrection to live, as Jesus said. That, that is our expected hope. We can look forward with confidence to everlasting resurrected life. When you think about that, does that give you hope this morning? Right? It, it absolutely should. You should be filled with hope in that. But Peter also tells us that believers have been given a new life by God, evidenced by a spiritual birth in the life of the believer. Born again, as Jesus told Nicodemus. New creations where the old is gone and the new has come. Believers are given a new life by God, a life filled with the Spirit of God, a life filled with the peace of God. Peter also says that believers have an inheritance waiting, an inheritance that will not perish or spoil or decay. Paul spoke of it. John spoke of it. The writer of the letter of Hebrews spoke of it. Jesus spoke of it. An everlasting inheritance kept securely for you in heaven as an inheritance is passed from the father to his child. Believers in Jesus are given the right to be called children of God, John wrote in his gospel. Children, born not of an earthly father's will, but born of the will of God, given the new life. And hence we can call him our father, Abba, Daddy. And as Paul reasons in the book of Romans, if we are children, then we are all heirs, heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ. 
And, you know, when you think about that, I, I think we limit ourselves when we think about what this inheritance will be. We really do, because we think of what we have here. But can you begin to imagine it? Just begin. I certainly can't. <laughs> I mean, I can't imagine what that all means, to be co-heirs with Christ. It's definitely not something we would think about here. All the stuff we can put together here will not come close. I believe we get a minuscule glimpse of it, though, when the Holy Spirit comes to dwell in our hearts. That joy, that peace, that love, that grace that just overwhelms us. And also in those moments in our lives when we know our Lord has made himself known even more to us. Those times when his presence just washes over us. And I think those are just little hints of what kind of overwhelming joy awaits us in our inheritance. Remember, Jesus told his followers, us, <laughs> that he's preparing a place for those who believe in him. If you're a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ this morning, know this, he is preparing a place for you right now. And it'll be perfect. It'll be incredible. We, we don't even have enough adjectives to describe it all <laughs> because it'll be too glorious for words. The Apostle John was given a vision, the book of Revelation. And in it, it describes just what that place, what that inheritance will be like. We see it in the 21st chapter of Revelation. And, and we're not going to turn to it, but I invite you to read it later today. But here, here's a few highlights of what John saw and what he tells us about this place. It'll be new. It'll be holy. Made new by Jesus himself. It'll be the place where God dwells with his people. There'll be no more death. No more crying, no more mourning or pain. God himself will wipe away every tear. The thirsty will drink from the spring of the water of life. And on top of that, those who are victorious, meaning those who are victorious in Christ, they will inherit all of this. This will be given to you by your heavenly Father. There will be a new Jerusalem. A new city, shining with the glory of God, which is so bright that there is no need for the sun. The foundations and gates of this city are adorned with precious jewels, and it has streets of gold. And there will be a river running right through the middle of that city, just like we saw in the Garden of Eden, where God dwelt with Adam and Eve. And it says the crystal clear water of life flows through this river, and in the middle of that river, the tree of life. The same tree that was in the garden that Adam and Eve were prohibited from eating after they fell because it would have given them eternal life in their fallen state. But in this new place, this new heaven, this new Jerusalem, the curse from the garden is lifted and the tree of life produces its eternal life-giving fruit. And you will inherit that and eat from that tree. And the throne of God and of the Lamb is in that city. There we will serve him joyfully. We will worship him, singing, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. Worthy is the Lamb to receive all honor and glory and praise. And we shall see his face. This, this, my dear brothers and sisters, this is our inheritance. This is the living hope that we have. All because of the cross of Jesus. All because of his resurrection that we will follow. <laughs> The cross where sins are forgiven and believers are saved. Where regeneration of souls and the beginning of a new life in Christ, peace with God begins. Where hope and resurrection and an inheritance in the new heaven and new earth are assured. And we also noted earlier that any mention of the cross must also include his ascension. We read in the first chapter of the book of Acts that the disciples all watched Jesus taken up into heaven. They saw him pass behind a cloud. Two men dressed in white stood by them. Why are you staring at the sky? The same Jesus who has been taken from you will come back in the same way you have seen him go into heaven. He ascended into heaven physically, defying every law of physics that we know. His exaltation by God made complete. He's the great high priest above every other inscription, and he's interceding for us right now. And in the fullness of God's time, he will return. Much of the book of Revelation tells us what that will be like in the only way that John could. He saw things that words couldn't describe, but he wrote as he was led. Jesus 
will return. No matter what position you take on it, scripture is clear, he will return. He will return riding in glory. He will return riding on the clouds as a victorious and conquering king. Jesus also told us that we must be ready because the Son of Man will come in an hour when you don't expect him. But when he returns, everything, everything will be restored. His kingdom will have fully come in all of its splendor like it was in the garden. He will dwell with his people like he did in the garden. All will be restored. In the meantime, while we wait, while we sojourn here, he hasn't left us as orphans. He sent the Holy Spirit as he promised. The blessed third person of the Trinity. The Holy Spirit is a person. It's not an it. It's a he. The one who resides in our hearts as a guarantee of the promise of the inheritance. He's there to encourage us, to comfort us. He's there to hold us and lead us closer to God. He's there to pray on our behalf when we can't come up with words to pray. He's the presence of God in our hearts. He's the agent of change in our lives. We see the fruit of the Spirit, kindness, compassion, gentleness, humility, love, all from the Spirit of God dwelling in our hearts, all made possible by the cross. Jesus died. Jesus rose. Jesus ascended. And as we close and as we conclude this, this series, I think we can definitely come away with this. There's incredible power in the cross of Christ. The centurion saw it, he was moved by it. Joseph of Mar Arimathea saw it, he was moved by it. It has life-changing power that moves us. It brings us from death to life. It breathes life into otherwise dead souls. It gives us real hope for eternity. It brings us into fellowship with God Almighty because we are washed clean by his blood. It fills us with the Holy Spirit. And as all things that no one and nothing has the power to do, only the cross, only the cross has that power. So as we summarize this, what, what does the cross mean to us? Well, I just kind of came up with a list of what I think it means. It means that Jesus, the Lamb of God, the Son of God, suffered and died for our sins and saved us from the wrath of God. It means that Jesus was buried in the tomb. It means that he rose again, conquering death itself. It means that he ascended to heaven, exalted to his rightful place in the right hand of God. It means that his Holy Spirit has come to dwell in us, comforting us and encouraging us. It means that we are now adopted children of the living God. It means that we have an inheritance waiting for us. It means that we will be ushered into heaven after we take our last breath. It means that we will be reunited with a glorious resurrected body that will dwell with God in a new heaven and new earth. It means that we will drink from the river of life and eat from the tree of life. It means that we will see his face. And this will be forever. All because of his great love for us. All because of the power of the cross. So my question to you is, do you know that love? Do you know the love of God the Father? Do you see the love of his son on the cross? Do you know the joy, the joy that Mary had, hearing Jesus call you by name? Maybe you don't, maybe you're not sure. Maybe you've backslidden in your faith. But maybe he's calling your name right now. His nail-pierced hand is reaching out to you from his exalted place. Take that hand. Cling to your Savior. Know that his blood was shed for you. Only he could do that for you. There's nothing we can do, nothing we can say that earns God's forgiveness. It's given. It's a gift by his grace so that no one, no one can boast. Our Savior's risen. He is risen indeed. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we exalt you. We thank you, Lord, for, for the power of the cross. We thank you that Jesus rose from the dead. And it was confirmed, it was seen. He ate. He told them where the fish were. He made them breakfast. He restored Peter. And he ascended to his rightful seat. He's the King of Kings, Lord of Lords. And he's our Savior. And Father, because of that, because of the power of the cross, 
You have quickened our dead souls to life. You have brought us into fellowship with you. You have given us peace that we can never explain. Father, we thank you. All we can do is come to you with thanks. We rejoice. We rejoice knowing that we will follow you in resurrection. We have a hope. We have a living hope. And that hope is Christ. That hope is the resurrection of Christ. And on this Easter morning, we celebrate that, Lord. We thank you for that. We thank you for saving us from our sin. We thank you for calling us. We thank you for giving us the faith that we have. Father, I pray that each one of us would continue to just marvel at what you have done for us and live a life that is filled with joy. We pray that your Holy Spirit would continue to just pour itself into our hearts, that he would be prominent in our lives, and that we would serve you, we would worship you, filled with your Spirit. And Father, we always remember the words of Jesus, the words that taught us so many things, but the words that taught us how to pray. As we gather as a church this morning on this Easter Sunday, we pray, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. 